What's going on, guys? Uh, Master Coach, Education Director Aaron Guyette here on the Living Fit Show, and I have the extraordinary pleasure of having Dr. Andy Galpin on. Um, first of all, uh, I'm I'm sort of like a creepy fanboy. I uh, just want to get that out on the air and in the open right now. Um, I've had the great pleasure of meeting a bunch of Dr. Andy Galpin's close friends that are kind of around him with, through Barbell Shrug and Kenny Kane and um, all of that. But I've never actually met Dr. Andy Galpin. I was even, when I moved from Southern California to Northern California, recommending people because I found out through the Body of Knowledge, which was a, is a podcast that he does, um, that he has a lab. Unfortunately, I just found out that that lab has been shut down for – quite a while due to COVID, um, but hopefully when it gets back and going, I'll continue to push people to go check it out and learn from this brilliant man, Dr. Andy Galpin. Uh, thanks for jumping on the show. Yeah, like you said, man, it's great to connect. We have a lot of mutual friends, so I always like you know, mending bridges between all that stuff, so that's that's great to do, and um, most people will describe me as fairly creepy myself, so I'm, I'm totally down with that <laughs> self-description. Creep factor 10,000. Here we go. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, so first, I, I think you know, if for those that don't know um, Dr. Andy Galpin, he has a love affair with uh, the Seattle area. He has a bit of a love affair also with a rapper, Tupac, Tupac. How, am I saying that correctly? It was <laughs> yeah, tough to pronounce. You're going to punch me in the face. I could see it now. Uh, but yeah, so you got you got a family and kids. You're now in Southern California because you teach at Cal State University Fullerton. Is that correct? Yep. And is that like that's the main gig that you're doing now? Yeah, I'm, I'm a tenured professor, full professor down here. Um, so I run the Center for Sport Performance. So we you know conduct and disseminate research that enhances sport performance. So I teach at the senior and graduate level in sports nutrition, strength and conditioning, program design, muscle physiology, uh, things like that. And then, of course, uh, on the side, I also work with professional athletes, most extensively in combat sports. So a lot of wrestlers and boxers, uh, a lot of UFC fighters, but also Olympic weightlifters, a little bit of powerlifting and major League baseball and things like that. So um, a little bit of research, a little bit of teaching, and then a little bit of um, application, if you will, working with, you know, just those elite athletes. So. Nice. So, yeah, walk me through then what, what um, I think most people can imagine, you know, what a lab looks like or, or it seems like if they've been through some sort of college course or whatnot, and then obviously what a classroom setting looks like. But then if you're, you know, sort of moonlighting, if you will, or, or um, your side hustle is is, is – professional athletes um, and high level athletes, are you stabbing their muscle fibers and pulling those and, and giving them feedback on that or which is, you know, kind of coming from the lab stuff that you do, or are you doing like nutrition or is it a little bit of anything and everything? Yeah, it, it runs the gamut. So the vast majority of athletes I work with are remote uh, and that's been that way for years now, actually, just because of circumstance. Uh, but my role is, I would say the best way to define it is uh, I am a professional problem solver. And so typically an athlete will come to me because they're either trying to make sure that they're optimizing their performance or because they've had a loss or some sort of issue that they can't overcome. And so my job is, in my mind, to help them optimize total human performance. Uh, what that means is I will perform pretty extensive analyses. So that could be a combination of laboratory stuff. So muscle biopsy or performance testing, motion analysis, you know, any of the standard you know, performance metrics one would look at. It could also be just a conversation about their process. It could be sleep tracking, blood work, uh, you know, gut microbiome testing, really any combination of their training schedule, um, any of that stuff that we'll look at. So step number one is perform, again, a kind of in-depth analysis to figure out what is your primary goal and why aren't you getting it? Once we have identified the one or two or three, what I call defenders of those goals, so what's stopping you from achieving that goal, 
then my job is either to solve that problem myself, if it's something that I feel like I can do, or to hire uh, or to bring in or to point them in the direction of the person who I feel like can do that. So if it is something simple, like a major league baseball player comes to me and they just want to add five pounds of muscle mass over the course of the off season, that's well within my skill set. So I might be programming their strength and conditioning. I might be programming their nutrition, their supplementation. We might do some blood work testing and get a DEXA scan, uh, something like that. Maybe it's more advanced and we're having some sleep issues and I might try initially, but if it takes me more than sort of the first three to five, six, seven most common uh, issues that I can resolve. From there, I might say, okay, we need to bring in a true content expert in this area. So let's reach out to my friend in uh, Australia, or let's reach out, bring this person in from Boston that I know, depending on their sport situation, their financial abilities, etc. So uh, I would say the one skill set that I bring that's a bit unique is understanding what areas that I am you know, pretty good in and which ones I'm you know, just satisfactory. And, and so with the athletes, again, my job is to figure out which of all of these things do they really need to invest their time, money, and mental energy in, and which ones maybe are not that important. Yeah, I think that's <clears throat> one of the most common pitfalls of the, you know, general fitness trainer, right? They get into their trainer job and they're like, I, I can do it all. I can handle it all. Um, they forget that there's like echelons of care and people that refer out. And, and I think that, I think that probably the most common psychology there is, pro is probably like the scarcity <laughs> mindset. Like if I refer out, then I'm going to lose that person or something like that. And usually that's the opposite, right? The fact that you're refer referring them out, they're stoked on you even more yeah. and will almost most always. likely come back once the thing that needs to happen happens. Right. Yeah. And in fact, I'll say this more bluntly, I never, a single time in my career have I had an athlete leave because I suggested we bring somebody up. Never once has that happened. So I'm, I'm I, I don't even hesitate. In fact, I, I tell them that's the gig, right? Um, yeah. If they have a very difficult problem, uh, then we need to bring in somebody who's extremely good at solving that problem. And I'm very quick to tell them I, I, that's, I, I can't do that. I'm not good enough for that. I don't know enough about that area. Mm -hmm. uh, and like you mentioned, they never lose confidence in me because of that. Never. Yeah. Yes. And also, you know, it shows them that I'm really interested in solving their problem for them, not keeping them as a client, which yeah. counterintuitively means or makes them want to continue to be my client even more because yeah. they know I have their best interests in mind. In interesting how trust works, right? Trust yeah. and buy-in and all that, right? Um, yeah, we actually, we had a, a kind of an elite group of like lifter slash workouters, whatever you call it, uh, at a gym that I owned in Southern California. And we did the opposite. We would go to other facilities. We would go to other gyms and, and then we would do this like challenge thing. Cause we wanted to learn from their skill set, what they, how they trained, how they did their thing. Um, and then we would invite them and almost to a T like we would go there and they would almost never come you know, back to us. And I, I liken it to that same sort of mindset. It's like this scarcity uh, mindset, unfortunately. Um, so obviously you're way deep in the weeds um, and you have, you do have a, a pretty incredible skill set uh, or skill sets um, and a great network, but that wasn't always the case. What kind of brought you into wanting to learn about this thing that is fitness and physiology and nutrition and, and all this stuff? Um, was it sports as a kid or, or did you just fall into it in college or how did that work for you? I'd say my story is fairly similar to any other faculty member you'd find in kinesiology or exercise science. I was a pretty talented athlete, but not incredibly talented. So I, the carrots incentives were lined up perfect. If I trained better, if I did things at a higher quality, more effectively, then I notice changes in performance. And when you're an exceptional athlete, sometimes it doesn't matter what you do and you're always great. And so the, you're not really incentivized to make sure your process is perfect. Mm -hmm. And the opt-in is spectrum. I, I wasn't such a bad athlete where it's like, well, it doesn't matter how awesome you are at these things, you're still going to be terrible. <laughs> so I was, I was in that, that middle group, right? I had uh, a lot of success, um, but not so much where 
everything just came easy and I was an all American for doing nothing, right? I had to optimize my process. So I, I mean, I started lifting weights at home when I was probably 12 or 13 or something like that. I don't remember. I was fortunate. Uh, strength training was a huge component of our high school program. So uh, I, I did a lot of it then. And I had parents that just simply supported getting better. Right. And I come from a community, my sport coaches, family, every kid I grew up with, all of their parents. So I, I truly mean this when I say community to where losing was totally acceptable. And, and all those things happened because we don't come from a big area and we weren't particularly talented in most things. However, laziness or just loathed, uh, not preparing, not doing whatever you could just in general, people despise that in our community. So I just like, I'd love to take credit for it, but I can't, it's just, a, I just grew up thinking like, why would you not wake up early and go an extra? Why? Like, I don't understand why you would not lift on a set. Like, who cares? Like these things don't enter into the mind of most of the people I grew up with as rational reasons why you wouldn't prepare and do everything you can to get the best out of it. So, I just had that mentality going into college then as a college football player, the same thing. And I was sort of shocked, honestly, as most of my teammates, I, I did not get along with, right? Because they were far more concerned with the color of their gloves matching with the band on their ankle. And I was just like, I just want to squat. And I just want to like, and I hated going to practice. And I'm like, are you kidding me? This is like what all of my friends and I did on the weekends is like the greatest thing ever is play seven on seven. Now, when we have seven on seven practice, you guys get, you're pissed and you're all complaining. I just did not get it. Yeah. I'm like, I love this shit. What, what are you guys talking about? I want to train. <laughs> like they pissed when we have to do weights. I'm like, are you kidding me? So, uh, you know, it carried on from there. And then, I, I mean, it didn't take me long to realize that that's, you know, if I could find a way to make a living where all I have to do is talk about strength training and sports and people are going to pay me a tremendous amount of money to do that. Sold. So, <laughs> so Yeah. So the, um, obviously then I'm guessing you took that same work ethic, that same sort of mentality and attitude into the books. Um, I mean, because a PhD, last time I checked, they don't just hand them out. You got to earn them. Right? I mean, Is yes, that... no. To be, <laughs> uh, you know, I come from the country, man. I spent three quarters of my high school, my senior year of high school uh, on a tractor or in the weight room. So I, I was not academically prepared, uh, not, not even close to college. And I went to a, a fairly difficult um, academic institution. So I, I was not prepared for that. I, I did I did not do exceptional, and not because like I was, wasn't focused. I worked way harder than probably anyone I knew in college. And I still had a three point, I don't know, one or something GPA. So I'm not this like 4.0, but I, I worked way, way harder to just get through your basic physics classes, chemistry, stuff like that. Obviously I performed better in exercise physiology and stuff than I did in physics. Uh, but my, my point is like, I wasn't, the academic side wasn't there for me. So then going on to my master's and PhD, I was I honestly, it was, I was pretty scared. I was just like, I don't think I could, I don't know if I could do this. Cause like I just barely passed chemistry and that's what's just giving everything I had to. So I just don't have a lot of horsepower in that area to be candid, uh, memory and stuff like that's just not where I thrive. So I was just like, I don't know. And then when I got to grad school, I realized like, this is the same shit. This is not harder. This is just a test of who wants to actually get through here. Your passion, your ability to, to work, your desire to really be there. That's, that was more important. And then the same thing as a PhD. So honestly, like, I feel like if you can pass your undergrad, you can get a PhD. Yeah. It's just about it's just about give, finding someone to give you a chance. And the way you find someone to give you a chance is to show those things that you have an interest in research, that you have an interest in supporting the faculty members. Not about you; it's about helping them. Um, that you, you know, five a.m. Sure, let's go. When we get to midnight, no problem. Sundays, yeah. It's if you have those kind of attitudes, anyone can get a PhD in our field. It's just not that hard, really. It, it honestly isn't because of those same things. I'm like, I'm just not an academically strong student like that. Uh, but the PhD wasn't hard. It was just about like, are you willing to just keep working? Are you willing to be poor as fuck for 10 years? <laughs> <laughs> That's really what it was. And I was yeah. poor anyways, my whole life. So I was like, fine, I don't care. Let's yeah. just keep going. Yeah. 
Let's keep yeah, keep this keep this ball rolling. Yeah, uh, I didn't care. It was no different for me. In fact, I was making more money as a graduate student than I ever had in my life. So, oh, nice. I didn't really care. You know, I was getting seven hundred bucks a month or something as a master's <laughs> student, and like twelve hundred as a doctoral student. So, I left those programs with money in my bank account than more than when I started. So, yeah, and you had a roof over your head, and you got food in your belly. What's, yeah. what's not to like? Yeah, yeah, I was so stoked. I mean, I even bought a house as a doctoral student on that kind of money. Right. And you did, did, you said? Yeah. Yeah, for sure I did. Yeah. It was yeah. like a $65,000 house. That's what happens when you live in central Indiana. You could buy a house for $65,000. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. You, why, why did you pay off your house before you paid off your car? Because I could. Because <laughs> the payments were lower. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess I, now I'm curious, juxtapose that with um, the student body that you encounter today. Are you, do you experience little pockets of, you know, people like yourself um, where, you know, she or he is just ready to get after it and might not have the horsepower intellectually, but is just ready to be there night and day and and do the work? Um, Or is that sort of surmounted by an avalanche of the opposite? Or yeah, what's the thermometer say? Well, I mean, I'd say you have to think about kind of where I'm at. So Cal State Fullerton is you know, public state school. It's also incredibly effective and high in its minority population and it's first in your family to go to college population and it's um, underserved community populations. All these metrics, uh, you know, we lead the nation in or we're second in the country and something like that. So it's a very high concentration of those individuals combined with the fact that 95%, sometimes up to 98% of our students are commuters. So they don't live on campus. They're not living and dying college. They're working 30, 40 hours a week or more. Uh, they often maybe, if they don't have that, they maybe have one part-time job, but they have kids or they live and take also take care of their aunt or their little brother or whatever it is. And so when I was in school, you know, you know I had to work. I, I was a janitor, actually, so I had to clean the the dorm rooms of my and then fellow you solved, teammates. Uh, high level math problems in the <laughs> yeah, spare time, <laughs> just minus that part. Uh, so I mean, that's another point. Like I spent four years cleaning the bathrooms of my teammates and the girls I was trying to hook up with, and, and just because like I didn't have the ability to pay the tuition without it, right? Yeah. So, but I was on campus. Is my point? Like that was it. Like my whole life was football and college. Yeah. Wake up in the morning seven days a week, like this is it. Our students don't have that luxury. In fact, it's not even half of their life most of the time. So it's difficult to surmise whether they're, it's just a lack of focus, it's ability, or they just, they don't, it's not the actual truest high priority in their life because it shouldn't be the highest priority in their life. Having said that, I, I don't even really care about GPA to be honest. I don't look at GRE scores at all for our grad students that apply. It is abundantly clear to me, though, two things. When you do have those academically strong students, it, it's you, you don't miss that. Right? It's, it shows very, very clearly. So to the folks who are like, oh, the GPA doesn't matter. It does. I promise you. When you have a 4.0, it, you, your teacher will notice, oh, you're very smart. And that's a good thing. If you don't have that skill set like I did, that's fine because the other ones also stand out really, really clearly. So those folks that are you know, they're always on class on time. They're never leaving early. They're never on Facebook in class. Right? If they're on their phone, it's usually, it's like, okay, fine, that happens, right? But you're going to check a quick text or you get back. Um, you clearly have notes. You have organization in your notes or some other one, which is not, you're just not like scrambling down. You clearly have gone after class. You've, you've done some sort of post work on it to make sure that you have this stuff, whatever. Like you can just tell that next level of, wow, okay, you're getting after it here. Um, they often have more thoughtful questions or actual questions and you can just see in their eyes like they're not there to just get through this class because they have to have this because it's on their grad check you know checklist and, um, they're oftentimes they're around more they're they're asking to be involved more and then when you give them opportunities they just they just do tenfold what you ask right so it's the classic hey you want to volunteer in the lab okay great we have subjects coming in at nine o'clock tomorrow morning Okay, great. I show up to the lab at eight. They're already there. They're dressed. They're great. 
oh yeah, I noticed um, the trash hadn't been taken out. So I took the trash out. I don't know where to go with it, but I made a note to myself. Oh, and also like, I'd, you're like, oh, okay. Like, I don't care if you know anything. I don't care if your GPS two, <laughs> if you have a GPS 2.0, I don't care. I want you on my team. <laughs> yeah. It, it's honestly that basic stuff. And that stuff stands out very, very clearly because so few students do do it. Yeah. And, and again, it's hard for me to tell if that's just because, hey, you know, I worked the night shift. I couldn't get there because I was still at work. Or if it's just like they don't really understand what it takes to stand out when you have 2,000 undergraduates in the same program. If you want to stand out, you've got to do something special. Yeah. Yeah. So that then that brings me into I'll just kind of <clears throat> wave top on the fact that, you know, obviously you've got a lot of published work. Um, and <clears throat> and I've, I've heard some of the stories. I, I can't remember the uh, – on body of knowledge, the professor that you had where I think you guys were all in tears. Um, Oh, with Lee Brown, Lee Brown. There you go. Yeah. Um, but just hearing his story of just walking people through and it sounds to me like that sort of has become your story, obviously at a much smaller level. Um, cause the guy has just been around, um, for a really long time. Um, but <clears throat> yeah, so, so walking students through, getting their, their work published or even, you know, getting your own work published. Um, but aside from that, so it, you know, obviously we have some of our audience that wants to dive into the research and kind of understand, um, at a academic level, deep level, um, big word level, right. Uh, what's going on with our physiology, what's going on with the human body. Um, but then you do, Kind of these five minute physiologies, which I think are incredible, um, a great way to begin, like get into like, okay, what is going on here uh, with my body? How, do, how does this thing work? Um, and so recently, uh, Marcus, he's one of our master coaches and I, we were talking layperson conversation, you know, gen pop com conversation about um, is hypertrophy different than strength? What is hypertrophy? What is strength? Um, you know, obviously hypertrophy building, uh, lean body mass muscle, um, but then just being strong. And I know we talked obviously before this, you said you've done basically three hours, you said three hours worth of, uh, work on diving into that well, deeply. Like 600 hours of work, but three hours of video. <laughs> correct. Yes. Six hours of video, 600 hours of work. Correct. Yeah. Um, and, <clears throat> and so obviously this is coming from, you know, you, uh, doing muscle biopsies, uh, in the lab, uh, all sorts of different metrics that you're pulling this information from, as well as, you know, the actual like academic work learning on the front end to even get into all of that. So I would like to do a little bit, obviously this, this will be like five minutes uh, worth. So this is our own little five minute physiology here, um, which is clearly not enough time considering 600 broken down into six hours. So first I just want to refer people, would it be, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin.com. Is that where they would find this uh, or YouTube? Yeah, I don't, I don't use it much. Uh, but yeah, YouTube, just search Andy Galpin on YouTube. It's, um, I try to post the ones I can on Instagram and the links of course are on Twitter yeah. as well. But, um, I mean, we could do as much of those videos as you want. I don't care about protecting it to make sure viewers go there. I could do the whole damn thing right here. I don't really care. <laughs> uh, yeah, but I, yeah, so I would just be curious. So diving deeper than, you know, obviously we can look at the basics of sets and reps, um, you know, and kind of like yeah. the CSCS approach or whatever. Um, but then we can also, I would like to dive deeper. Okay. Let's tear this apart. What does this look like yeah. inside the muscle? Why, yeah. why is, what is hypertrophy? What is strength going on in there? What does, what does that look like? Yeah. How, how is that experience? So let me, let me lay a little foundation here and then we can go. So what I globally do, I talked in the intro about the <clears throat> courses I teach and all that. And many years ago, I just became frustrated in the fact that, you know, here I am teaching uh, these classes and, you know, only 25 students can get in or 40 students. And my classes just had full wait lists every semester know i teach summer extra and winter and it's just i was just like this is so dumb in 2017 2015 whatever it was that only 25 people can get to know this but why it's just dumb or 40 doesn't make any sense we have this and it also didn't make sense to me that 
I was teaching the same lecture over and over again. I'm like, this is not a good use of my time. You have students in the room who already know 80% of this information. So you're wasting, and, and you actually are, you're wasting a lot of their time. <clears throat> you're not particularly stimulating or interesting to them. You're helping them develop bad habits because now they're going to work on their projects during class, etc., which is distracting. It's, it's annoying for me, the other students don't like. And then you have these other students who are like, man, it's been all these years since I had physiology. <clears throat> now I'm coming back and this is way too fast. And I just thought like, this is a terrible model for education. So I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to start filming all this stuff. I'll do five minute videos where I just get right to the answer. 25 minute where we get to the answer and explain why it's happening. And I do 55 minute videos where I just cover the entire. So I started doing that. And, uh, you know, as we were sort of talking earlier, I don't have really any interest in marketing and running a business at all. So I'm like, I'm not going to try to build a business behind this stuff. I'm just going to make these damn videos and put them up there for free. And I'll just try the Patreon sort of model. And if people enjoy it, they can donate. And that's great. They can support it. But I also didn't want these things to be behind a paywall when you've got folks like my students who are like, dude, I just want to know how to eat better. And I just want to know how to exercise a little bit. And I don't want to spend three years taking uh, preliminary courses like just to figure out how do I squat better? I don't really understand how to program. Like that to me, I'm like, it's, not, it's dumb. Uh, people don't have that kind of money. All right, I can't justify $1,000 for the course. So I'm like, I'm just throwing all that away. I'm just doing it for free. So anyone, anywhere in the world, if they got internet, uh, and if you, if you have a little bit of financial means, a couple bucks to support it on Patreon, you can. If not, I don't care. It's all free. So that's what these videos basically are. Coming down to the hypertrophy one, you know, I've done several, there's probably, I don't know, five or six or seven or eight videos on hypertrophy there. Mm -hmm. fine, but um, we just learned a lot in the last two years. And so I thought, I'm just going to do a whole series on what we've learned in the last couple of years. Uh, and me as a physiology guy, I, I like the the muscular side of the equation, right? So I like to know specifically what part of the muscle is growing, how is it growing, why is it growing? And so I broke the video up into three sections, if you will. So part one is the actual physiology. So I explained to you how muscles actually work. And, and I guess I'll, I should have said this. My assumption with all of these videos is that you have not taken a single course in anything. Um, having said that, I believe that if you have a PhD in, in the area or you are not in the area whatsoever, both of those people can watch those videos and learn something and, and be not just bored out of their teeth the entire time. And I think I do a pretty good job of keeping those things very easy to follow. Yeah. Regardless, even though I'm talking about some pretty high level stuff, it, it's not particularly complicated to follow. So the first video in the series is, you know, what we've learned about actual muscle tissue. So again, how muscles work, how they contract, um, how that results in human movement, how that results in muscle growth, what part of the muscles grow, why they grow that way, what you can do about it, etc. Um, I show actual muscle biopsies. I'll show the actual, what it looks like, human muscle as we pull it out of the skin, what it looks like on the microscope, uh, individual muscle fibers from actual world-class athletes. Uh, I show you the videos, I show you the pictures in, in all pretty high depth. So you can see it's, it's heavy visually based there. Um, it explains you know how much you can grow and, and what areas and all that stuff. So from the second video then gets into what we call the mechanisms. So what are the things you can do to induce muscular growth? And I can walk back and give you actual answers on all this stuff. I kind of want to just lay out what's in the videos and you can yeah. pick and choose which ones you want to go into. Yeah. And then the third one is all practical application. So that one goes over, okay, how many reps do you need to hit? How many days per week? Um, you know, does working out in a mirror really help? Uh, how about listening to music? Does that enhance how much you grow? Uh, are there particular types or tempos? So should you go fast with your repetition? Should you go slow? Does that matter? All that stuff that you would use as an actual thing. So that uh, video is an hour and, and all it does is cover what's the latest science tell us about all of these different things that you say, you know, what about drop sets? What about pyramid sets? Is that true? All that stuff is covered in the third video. So a lot of folks just will you know, skip to that one mm -hmm. um, and, th and that's fine. I will mock you and shame you just a little bit for skipping all the time <laughs> physiology, but 
uh, if you want just the hours and, and as many topics as you can think about, I cover in that, that last section. So that being said, we can dive into any one of the three areas or I could do a little overview of kind of all of them if you'd like, whatever. whatever yeah, uh, I think I think a, <clears throat> a quick overview and then a couple of, of you know, Prac app things because like i said you know 15 percent of our you know followers uh, subscribers listeners um they're the coach that they want to know you know part one part two part three they're gonna they're gonna dive into that and okay and so you know obviously they can just jump in to your videos and get the deeper deeper dive yeah of course but yeah and All then right. the rest will um, want to know part three and then we so let's look at that. at the highest level um you, human movement is created because of a combination of three things. So there has to be some sort of input coming from your spinal cord or brain, right? Your central nervous system. Uh, the nerves connect to muscle. The muscles then are surrounded by connective tissue. Those connective tissue come together to form a tendon. That tendon connects to the bone. So when I send a signal from my brain to contract my quad, that, that follows down the nerve. The nerve then tells which of those quadricep muscles or all four of them to contract. So the muscle itself contracts, that pulls on the connective tissue, the connective tissue, again, come into the tendon, that tendon then attaches to the bone. So when the muscle contracts and pulls, it pulls in the tendon, the tendon pulls in the bone, your knee extends, okay? So that's basic muscle function. Now, as I'm sure you talked about last time, um, there's a difference between strength and hypertrophy. So strength indicates that you can produce more force through that. And that could be because of improvements in the neurological system. It could be movement technique. It could be a result of the muscle fibers themselves getting stronger and producing more force, independent of getting bigger. It could be from the connective tissue being more efficient, or it could be something mechanical like uh, leverage, again, your squatting technique, the angles you're in. This is biomechanics and physics related, right? Hypertrophy is simply a result of your muscle getting larger. And there's multiple ways you can do that. In fact, that first video goes through all the different possible ways a muscle can, quote unquote, get larger, right? So when I look at you after, you know, 12 weeks of intensified training, I'm like, damn, you're so much bigger. There's a lot of things that could explain why you are actually bigger. And so some examples, your individual muscles are made up of millions of smaller muscle fibers. So think of this like a ponytail. So you would call that one ponytail but you actually know that's just simply a composite of hundreds of different individual hair follicles, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, if we're taking this analogy one step further, your individual muscle fibers are some of the biggest cells in all of biology. Uh, they're massive. And in fact, they, you can see them with your naked eye. So in the video, actually, I pull up, I, I take a piece of muscle, I put it in a Petri dish, and I pull out one individual muscle fiber with a pair of tweezers, and you can see it with your naked eye just sitting there. So they're massive. Now, they also have another special function in that they are they're what we call multinucleated, which is very, very rare in biology. So the nucleus, and if you remember your 10th grade biology class or whatever that was, the nucleus is what holds your DNA. Uh, and this is the primary thing that tells your muscle fiber to grow or shrink or repair, or whatever it is. Well, muscle fibers are so large that they require hundreds, if not thousands or millions of these nuclei in them. And so that gives you or affords you tremendous plasticity. In other words, you can respond very quickly to changes in stimuli because you have all these control centers that can notice, hey, we've been challenged, we've been stimulated, we, we need to adapt. Um, you can think of this like if you ran a company and there was one CEO, but you had 15 you know, branches across the country. Well, if a printer broke in your Tennessee branch, but the CEO's in Vegas, and you have to have the CEO's approval every time you need a new printer. Yeah, okay, with, with technology, okay, that can be done. But if the CEO had to go there physically look at it every time to approve it, this is a giant pain in the ass. If you can just put a CEO in every single one of your 15 plants and the same policy, okay, CEO has to look at the printer before I buy a new one. Well, now that can happen in minutes because the CEO is right there. Same thing with having a bunch of nuclei around, right? If you have one, it really slows down your ability to adapt. If you have them all over the place, you could do this very quickly. So in order for your muscle to grow, uh, those individual muscle fibers, one of two major things, and now we actually think it's three, can happen. So option number one 
is the individual muscle fibers themselves can get thicker, if you will. So the diameter. Um, so instead of looking like a tiny human hair, they look like a giant thick horse hair or something. Uh, that can happen. And if all of those individual fibers increase their diameter, then the diameter of the entire muscle collectively would be wider. And this is why I can have you flex your bicep and it goes, say, just above your shoulder in height. And then 12 weeks later, when your bicep is larger, I flex it. Now it goes three inches above your head, right? The actual diameter of the muscle is larger because the diameter of each of those individual fibers is larger. That's option one. Option two is what we call, that would be, by the way, what we would call classic or just hypertrophy, right? Mm -hmm. Option two is what's called hyperplasia. So this is, say, those individual muscle cells stay the same size, or maybe they get slightly larger. But what you've done is you've increased the total number of muscle cells in there. So you've either grown new muscle cells, which doesn't really happen, or the cells that are in your, your um, muscle have split. So one cell divides, if you will, and turns into two cells. And then those cells grow to the same size, and now you're occupying larger area. And that is an extremely controversial thing. And what we cover in depth in the video is where we started with that stuff, um, how we were told that hyper, hyperplasia doesn't occur for 40 years. And now we, we have strong evidence that, that that position is not correct. Mm -hmm. So I go over all that in the video, what we know now about hyperplasia, etc. And then even recently, something that's been speculated for you know 25 years, uh, but no one could ever show it until the last two or three years. And honestly, this is a large impetus in making the videos is because we have this sort of breakthrough of knowledge. Um, if the individual fibers get larger, the question is why or how are they getting larger? Um, to go a little, one step further, if you have a muscle fiber that contracts and produces force, something causes that con contraction. We call those two major elements, actin and myosin. So uh, the actin molecule will reach up, grab the myosin. It pulls two myosin, or uh, sorry, pulls two actin closer together. They stack on top of each other, and that's why your bicep grows vertically when you flex it, because these actin and myosin are stacked on top of each other, as opposed to laying side by side, if you will. Uh, Google sliding filament theory, if you want to see that yeah. or learn more. Well, is that hypertrophy or increase in size because those actin and myosin filaments got larger because if you got, if your muscle cell got larger, but you didn't increase the parts of the muscle that are causing contraction, this would mean that your cell got larger, but you don't have any more contractile force, which means you wouldn't be any stronger. Yeah. And now we start to see a divide between increasing strength and increasing size. And we can see clearly as an example, take a bodybuilder, bodybuilders who have larger muscle size than certainly most, uh, and they are stronger than most, no quads, question about it, but they're not necessarily the strongest people in the world. Yeah. And so clearly there is some relationship between muscle size and strength. As you increase size, you're most likely going to increase strength, but there comes a point where maximizing muscle growth is not going to maximize strength gains and vice versa. So optimizing for strength is not going to optimize muscle growth after several years of training right now initially the first hey six months or a year or two or even that those are probably going to go hand in hand but after that they they are quite different and so you need to program differently you need to eat differently and you do to all this stuff depending on which one you're maximizing so if you're getting sizes increases and it's not coming from those contractile filaments myosin and actin where is it coming from and this is something we have identified in the last couple of years and it's commonly referred to as sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. A fancy way of saying it's probably increased water in the cell. And this is what they think explains people like bodybuilders or other folks who gain large amounts of size, but not as large of increases in strength. Uh, also explains people partially what we call responders versus non-responders. So why you do the same workout as me, but you add 15 pounds of muscle and six inches to your quads and I add nothing. <laughs> Assuming sleep and attrition, all that's equated for, it's right? Like why hard gainers versus yeah. easy gainers. Yeah. However you want to think of it. 
or so why, when I rolled with the farm boy uh, this afternoon and he ate my lunch, uh, so to speak, and uh, he was not huge. So, yeah. Yeah. So all those things uh, are explained in more in part one. Um, anything you want me to go back and do on that or you want me to go into part two? No, I think that's, yeah, that's awesome. Let's go to part two. Okay. So uh, there's so much more there, right? I just did yeah. five minutes of an hour video. Yeah. Um, so now, okay, let's say we understand a little bit about what hypertrophy actually means. Now the next step is, can we identify what causes it? Right? Because if we know what causes it, then we have a better ability to cause it. And we don't waste as much time. So that part two is is the causes, what induces or causes most like hypertrophy. And you can kind of break it up into three main areas. So part one is mechanical tension. And think of this as the tension created on the muscle cells when you cause them to contract. More tension, uh, think, translate, think about this as more resistance, heavier weights, um, typically more hypertrophy, sort of. We'll come back to that. Uh, metabolic distress. And so think of this as the burn, right? So it's, it's got a burn. You've got to be causing some metabolite damage. And then number three is muscle damage. So the soreness. So those are the three global areas um, that can cause this internal cascade that will go to that nucleus and tell it, hey, start to replicate the DNA that builds the proteins that are, that are your muscle fibers. And that's what's going to cause that whatever it is, sarcoplasmic or contractile hypertrophy, either way, the only way you build new protein in your body is for your genes to express the DNA for that protein. So what we now know pretty clearly is muscle damage is somewhat related to hypertrophy, but very, very lowly. In other words, if you do a workout and tomorrow you're like, man, and I ask you, how sore are you? Scale of one to 10. And you say five. And I compare that to your next workout, and now your answer is nine. You will not grow more from the workout that gave you a nine out of 10 over the workout that gave you five out of 10. So that's what I mean when I say muscle damage or soreness is a terrible predictor of eventual hypertrophy. Huh. So the goal should not be to maximize soreness because we just know very clearly at this point that does not maximize growth, particularly if it then compromises overall volume so if you're so damn sore you can't work out two days from now or three days from now or whenever your next planned training session is or you have to do less weight that day or you have to do less reps whatever it is can't do certain exercises that actually will result in less hypertrophy and so you're, you're doing yourself not only is it not effective but it's actually a disservice it takes you in the negative direction um, so you don't want to use level of soreness as any indication of growth. Now, if your level of soreness is zero out of 10, okay, you probably aren't quite doing enough. Yeah. Like you need to feel something in the muscle you're trying to grow. Yeah. If you can go through an entire workout and you're trying to grow your glutes and you never feel your glutes contracting, you never feel a burn in your glutes, you never feel any soreness the day after, uh, you're probably not going to have a lot of hypertrophy there. What I am saying though is don't think, oh my God, I'm super sore today oh my God, the next day, like I can't even sit in the toilet for six days. That was a better workout. It's not. It was yeah. probably actually worse. Yeah. So we want to find that mid range probably of like three to five to six out of 10 is, is probably that level of soreness if you're trying to maximize hypertrophy. Uh, I'm cool if you stay under five. You probably can gain a lot between the areas of like two and four because you're going to be able to train very frequently. Mm -hmm. so, so exercise induced muscle damage is not a great predictor. Um, metabolic dis stress or distress, you know, the burn is somewhat associated and, and it's a good marker. Again, you, you probably should feel the muscle burning that you're wanting to grow. Right. Um, but as I mentioned at the beginning, muscle, muscle me mechanical tension appears to be the largest driver pretty clearly. So you need to do something to make the muscles contract. Now, early on, back when we were kids, we were told that that means something along the lines of eight to 12 repetitions per set 
um, 60 to 80 percent of your one rep max, something like that. If you go yeah. above 80 percent, you know, you can't do it for, you know, even as high as eight reps typically. And so the reps come down. That would be more of a strength stimulus. So something like 90 percent of your one rep max for three or four reps is probably going to induce a high amount of strength gains, but not a tremendous amount of, of uh, hypertrophy. And that's because there's not a lot of metabolic distress. You only did three reps. Not a lot of muscle damage. You only did three reps. You cause a lot of mechanical tension, but the total amount of work you accomplished is very low because yeah. you did three reps. Yeah. Go the other end of the spectrum. If you do, say, 12 or 15 reps, or even 20, 25, even up to 30 repetitions, you lose a lot of mechanical tension because you have to go very light. You get some soreness, but you get a tremendous amount of metabolic stress. Well, what we know now, and this is sort of fast forwarding onto video three just a little bit, is anywhere between five and 30 reps per set is all probably gonna result in about the same amount of hypertrophy. Hmm. So it doesn't particularly matter. Uh, I, I would typically say still, most of the time you wanna probably play in the eight to 15 range. You know, this is again, reps per set. Hmm. But it seems like the single largest driver of hypertrophy it's just simply total volume. Right? You just have to get work done. So if you want to do any combination of setups, so say Mondays, you do sets of five. And Tuesdays, you do sets of 10 to 15. And Fridays, you do sets of 35. That'd be a, a, we call it a standard daily undulating periodization approach, right? Yep. That probably works great. If you want to do more like a linear periodization where you just say, hey, this month I'm doing all eights to tens. And then next month I'm going all sets of 20. And then next month I'm going to go all sets of three to six. That'd be like a monthly undulating or linear periodization block. kind of. That probably works fine as well. And so programming for hypertrophy, I always say it is, it's, it's kind of idiot proof, right? Because it's just like you have to anywhere between five and 30 reps. Like just, just, just do that. Uh, and as long as you hit somewhere in the neighborhood of about 10 working sets per week per muscle, that's pretty much optimal for most people, especially beginners. So if you're talking about your biceps and say you do biceps twice per week and you do five sets of 10 in both your workouts, five sets Monday, five sets Thursday, there's your 10 sets for your biceps. Dunsky. Uh, optimal for the most highly trained folks is probably closer to 20 to 25 sets you know, per week. Uh, but certainly we see no loss of hypertrophy and we see maintenance and even strong gains with as little as 10 to, to maybe 15 sets uh, per week. So that's the advantage of understanding that molecular stuff Yeah, is it allows us then to figure out which programming decisions makes sense. So in that molecular video, I also cover things like testosterone and why that is incredibly overrated regarding hypertrophy. Uh, and most people are dead wrong. Um, women, growth of women versus men. And again, why people are dead wrong thinking women don't grow at the same rate as men grow in terms of muscle without testosterone use. Uh, so other common things about the molecular and hormonal side. Uh, and then there's part three, which I sort of started getting into, but yeah. Uh, do you want me to jump into three or? Yeah, let's do, uh, yeah, just a little snippet of three because I, I think it does help, you know, that five to 30 and then 10 sets to 25 sets. And I was going to interject a bit, right? So 10 sets, if the training age is zero or low, 20 to 25 sets will probably smash somebody and they won't be able to sit on the toilet or come into the gym. So then that's where you're saying you get that sort of actually negative effect where now I can't train. I can't do the volume because I crush myself. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So maybe yeah, starting at 10 sets and then going from there. Totally. Yeah. That's a good interjection. That's, um, I always like to start a little cautious. You can, especially like the first or second workout, you can always come back the next workout and go way up in volume, but you can't yeah. ever take that volume away after you did. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> so, like, well, so please. And, but that comes from you being there so many times. I've been there. I'm sure a lot of people watching have been there too. Like you don't have to go there again. That's no. <laughs> coming from a doctor. You don't have to yeah. go there again. <laughs> yeah, you don't. You don't need to be pushing that. I mean, I get it as a personal trainer. Yeah. There's a certain amount of the clients want to feel like they got their ass kicked today. Yeah. So my recommendation is find a way to cheat that system. In other words, find a way to get them really high burn, but low damage. Yeah. So this is typically uh, isolation movements, right? As much as I, I prefer multi-joint movements, I prefer barbell squat and deadlift over a machine leg extension. But if I know that my person, you know, is really worried about their quads and that's the thing they want to get better at, I'm for sure going to put them on a leg extension machine and make sure that they feel their legs burn. Like there's a part like you have to give them uh, like what they want at some point. Yeah. Um, just minimize the eccentric component that will minimize the damage. So you can do a lot of reps if it's concentric only or minimally eccentric. Um, so no landing, don't do box jumps and things like that where there's a huge landing component the first couple of workouts because they're going to get ripping sore. Yeah. Right. Do the, the simple things uh, <clears throat> to get them there. So yeah, I mean the the video covers all that stuff. Frequency, how many days per week? Um, turns out it doesn't matter a tremendous amount, right? Um, as long as you get the total volume in, it doesn't really matter if you train twice per week, you know, again per muscle group, or three times. Having said that, if you are pushing to the higher volume range, so you're trying to get closer to that twenty sets, that starts to get hard in one workout. Yeah. <laughs> so that's when frequency um, probably gives you a lot of help, right? It's because now you can actually accomplish the total amount of work. So frequency doesn't matter per se, except for when it allows you to accomplish more total work. And then, of course, more frequently, the better. Um, intensity is, again, really a byproduct of the rep range. So let that guide you uh, more so than anything else. Uh, eccentric probably going to get you a little bit more hypertrophy than concentric but again you got to balance that against how much more sore that that stuff makes you yeah um, so you have options there uh, all the classic bodybuilding bro science stuff it works basically all of it works right drop sets pyramid sets reverse loadings like all, it all works it all works pretty damn well because think about the mechanisms right so I have these options. It can be heavy or it can get me to burn or it can do a little bit of damage. If you're doing one of those two things, you're probably going to get some growth. Yeah. So they, they just, they're just different ways to kind of stack you to hit the light switch to turn on muscle growth. So all of that stuff you can play with. Um, now there is some intelligence that can be used with that programming, but the quick answer is all of it works. Yeah. It's just working differently, but that's okay. Right. Um, Again, lots of different ways to get the light switch on, but what you care about is getting the light switch on. And I feel like bro science kind of came about because they're bored of doing the same thing over and over again. So let's figure out a different way to get some sort of stimulus and then, okay, that's working. Yeah. So here we go. And but, it's it's a very good idea yeah. to add variation, not randomization, but variation to your training. Right? You don't want to just do the same thing for months on end. That's not going to work. So yeah, I, I totally agree that the reason they came up with the variation is saying, hey, we've been doing this thing for five months. We have to introduce this different stimulus. And it turns out every time you introduce a different stimulus, you tend to get more growth. Wait, so you said randomization. So you're saying that if I just randomly pick an exercise from Instagram and do that today and then do another one tomorrow, that I'm not going to maybe get the results that I want? Yeah. You know, <laughs> I, used to, I used to do this joke differently, but it doesn't work anymore. Like I used to say... You know, how many of you dictate your exercise choice? In other words, like what exercise you do today by which machines are open in the gym at the time you show up, right? Like every hand would go up. Like, yeah. no, or actually no hand would go up. And I'm like, honestly, how many of you were like, um, oh, that's open. I'll start with leg press today. Like, okay, now you're in. Yeah. That's how it really works. But now it's like, yeah, okay. How many of you did something you're programming today because you saw that exercise on Instagram in the last seven days? Yeah. Every hand. Every, yeah. So, okay, fine. Yeah, it, um, the difference between randomization and variation is intention. Do you have rationale, right? We're going to this variation over this variation because A, B, C, and D. That's intelligent programming. Um, a low-level personal trainer will do variation 
or randomization, they'll do different things. Uh, an effective and a, a coach or personal trainer that's going to be making long-term success, long-term gains, will be the person who thinks diligently about, okay, you know, we've been doing barbell hip thrusts with our back on a bench. Now, since we've developed the glutes in this fashion, when we're going to actually go to putting their feet on a bench because it'll actually activate the hamstrings a slight bit more. And we've removed RDLs from the program because it was irritating our back. And so we need something that activates the hamstrings a little bit more. So this is why I'm choosing this variation. We can get a little bit of groups, glutes, add back some hamstring, which we've taken out of the program. And now we're balancing. That is an intelligent program of choice. Not just like, hey, I'm getting tired of doing these glute bridges or these hip thrusts. Okay, let's do them a different way. Okay, and, well. And that's sort of a give, you know, you're giving people what they want by giving them what they need, right? It's like understanding totally. that intelligence too. It's like, okay, they're going to get bored after three weeks or four weeks or whatever. So, but I'm going to intentionally vary it and, and think about how I'm varying it to get, to continue their results. <laughs> but Yeah, that actually reminds me of another thing in the video that has become pretty clear recently. And that's what we call the mind muscle connection. In other words, um, muscle hypertrophy is explained probably more by intention of contraction rather than the actual numbers you put on. Huh. So let's say I, you know, we're going to do three sets of 10 at 70 pounds. Uh, it doesn't matter if I do sets of five or 10 or 12 or 70 pounds or 30 pounds or 80 pounds. What matters more is how hard I'm contracting and how much I'm focusing on that actual muscle. So unlike strength, unlike power, unlike speed, unlike those two, the volume and repetition prescription for hypertrophy is, in my opinion, almost totally irrelevant. Yeah. It's all about quality of contraction. Like so much so that when I program for my athletes, I don't even count. I, I, I don't count at all, other than for tracking purposes later. Yeah. So we'll write down the numbers and look, okay, where are we getting to? Where have we been? But in terms of prescription, I mean, my athletes always joke. Like, I don't even count. I'm always looking at, you know, some sort of movement intention or after or whatever. But they always ask, like, how many reps? And I know I don't, if I don't answer them, they're like, oh, fuck, okay. <laughs> like, they know what that means. This is going to suck. <laughs> well, it might be. I always ask them, like, how many reps? And it's as many reps as you can do at perfect quality. Yeah. And maybe that's six today. Yeah. Maybe that's 12. I don't know. If it's if it was twelve last week and ten the week before, eight the week before, so we've we've increased from eight to ten to twelve, and now today you get six. Okay, are you are you being kind of a little sissy today? Like yeah. You, or, hmm, maybe it's time for a deload. Maybe you run down. Yeah. So I use it as a metric like that rather than arbitrarily picking a number and saying. Okay, yeah. so <clears throat> you know, we quickly figure out like, is this a focus issue? Do you need to just pick it up today? Like you need to get into it or it's just like, hmm, um, if you're not doing that good, because I just want them to squeeze. Like oftentimes their eyes are closed and I just, okay, squeeze the thing, think about the muscle and contract and you'll get better growth from half the reps at half the weight Yeah. because the contraction is of a higher quality. Uh, it, mm -hmm. Particularly again, if you have a muscle or muscle group or part of your muscle that you're trying to target, make sure you're feeling and seeing that connection. Right, because for hypertrophy, it, it's all fake, right? All, all of strength training is fake for hypertrophy because it's just an external stimulus that's being used to help you contract. That's all it is. For strength training, that's not true. The thing is actually the thing, right? So for strength training, you're trying to learn how to move 200 pounds. Yeah. It, you can't practice with 170. You have to learn how to move 200 pounds. That's not fake, but hypertrophy is the opposite. It's put on 60 pounds, 600 pounds. I don't really care. You're trying to just figure out a way to make your muscle contract harder and fill that, that that's it. So, um, intention matters a tremendous amount, uh, for most people at the gen pop level, like I can track the numbers and stuff, but don't get too caught up in the programming, particularly if you can't get them to execute quality. So I will cut off sets a lot, right? Maybe it's just like if I stop feeling it in the muscle or you realize you're having to compensate movement, you're done, right? Yeah. Now, I would rather you stop, fully recover, and do another set 
then continue on just so you can hit that 16 reps or the nine reps yeah like that, that we just randomly made up anyways yeah yeah so. i love that because compensation <laughs> would that for me as like a trainer or a coach obviously their focus is there because they're trying with mm-hmm. everything literally <laughs> to make that thing happen um so it's not a focus issue okay this is clearly the quality's gone pull rest let's hit it again yeah yep. i love that that's great yeah so that that stuff is important um <clears throat> exercise order uh, predictably doesn't really matter. So if you want to do your big movements first and then go to your isolation movements, cool. If you want to do it the opposite, that doesn't really matter either. Yeah. Um, Which is not necessarily so a, the case for speed or power. Yeah, or exactly right. Strength, Again, not right. the case for, yeah. it, it, in fact, dead opposite right so if yeah. you screw up exercise order for speed power or strength you've, you've ruined the whole day yeah uh, with hypertrophy you can't ruin it yeah yeah it doesn't really matter um other stuff covered in that video uh oh uh like time of day right so people talk a lot about hey growth hormone is highest in the morning so you should that doesn't matter it doesn't matter at all what time of day you train uh, again, once equated for volume and work, so pick whatever fits your schedule. If you suck at working out in the morning, don't work out in the morning. If you yeah. suck at working out in the afternoon, work your ass out in the morning. Yeah. Get it get it done. Yeah. Um, whatever is most likely to have you not skip training sessions, to have you give a better effort in the training session, yeah. that will be much more important than some stupid amount of growth hormone. Because as I alluded to earlier, anyways, that stuff doesn't matter yeah. um, for predicting hypertrophy outcomes um, in the way that people think that they do. So that's sort of uh, another common thing that comes up in the video. And then there's just a bunch more, just things like that, uh, that you cover in there. Well, so for, yeah, for everybody who's um, hung out for us this long, um, obviously wealth of knowledge um, dove, dove into and wave top. And now you can dive into those videos, which are much longer and really uncover all the gold that's there. Um, so we do a question at every, at every single podcast, every single show. Um, and that question is what is living fit to you? And obviously not living fit, the brand, our, our brand, but what is, what is your idea of living fit? Um, and gotten tons of different answers from tons of different personalities from all over the board and in fitness and beyond. Um, so, uh, to finish it up, I'd love to hear, uh, Dr. Andy Galpin's "What Is Living Fit to You?" My answer to this is different than it would have been, say, eight to ten years ago. I think there are a handful of categories I strive for personally to consider myself more or less fit than I was before. So. I, I feel like I should be able to do something explosively. I have, should have some metric of speed or power. For me, you know, vertical jump, kicking power, punching power, sprint speed. Right? Some metric there has to be like. I believe strongly that it is very bad for humans to not express peak power, peak speed, right? Um, not speed on time to complete a crossfit workout that's not speed yeah um how high can you jump right now how fast can you sprint 50 meters with this type of stuff i believe the same thing for strength All right there's some requisite strength in the in the major movement categories so pull press upper and lower some sort of rotation right so this is a peak rate of force development this is contracting with as much tissue as you can muster up right, and get there. So something in the speed power range, something in the peak strength. Right? Number three, having some semblance of muscle mass. Different for all of us, different for different stages, but you've got to have probably more muscle mass, 5% more than your body wants to have. You know, something like that. Past that, you should have the ability to sustain maximal work, both at the local muscle and overall cardiovascular general human whole muscle performance level for 30 seconds plus or minus 
maybe up to a minute, right? You should be able to sustain that at an incredibly high rate. So think of this as anything from a farmer's carry for a minute with one and a half times body weight. Think of this as uh, output on an air assault bike or a rower or something like this. How much work can you accomplish? Can you do gassers on the basketball court? Things like this, um, a 400 meter sprint, whatever you want it to be. Can you do something in the, what we would call kind of VO2 max or max heart rate, three to 15 minute range, right? So think of this as a one mile. Can you run a six minute mile? Can you run an eight minute mile? Whatever it is for you. Can you run a four minute mile? Something like this, right? Where um, this is not long, slow cardio. This is, you're getting to a high heart rate very quickly and you just hold on and try not to die for some extended <laughs> amount of minutes. Which right. is kind of a 400 as well. <laughs> just Well, yeah, like, it depends. If you're really right. getting after it, right? At least but, afterwards you feel like you're going to die. <laughs> yeah, but I want that. I want you to, the difference is I want you to have to sustain that level of not die for many minutes at a time. Yeah. Right. So it's obviously a little bit lower. Yes. Uh, but, it, you know, even up to 8 to 10 to 12 minutes, something like this, right? Something in that moderate range could be a mile and a half. For most of the athletes, we look at the mile and a half as a target. But for some folks, you know, 10 minutes might be a month. Whatever, whatever that number is, doesn't matter. Yeah. And then the last one is, can you sustain work over at least 45 minutes without needing a single stop of break? Right? Bike ride, row, whatever. Can you put whatever that output is, 30% heart rate max, 60%, like you pick the number, but you should be able to move for 45 straight minutes without needing a break, period. So to me, um, those are the buckets that I always look at in determining, okay, am I, am I generally fit? If I have a huge, huge hole in any one of those, then I tend to look at myself as like, all right, you, you need to focus because you shouldn't have a hole in any one of those categories. You're going to obviously be better at some than others during different phases, phases of training, but you shouldn't be pathetic for your age, for your abilities, for your training background, for your health, uh, relative to yourself, not relative to me or anybody else. Right? Relative to yourself, you should be able to not be at your absolute worst in any one of those categories. And that is living fit to you. Yep. So do you find that there also, I just out of curiosity, I want to go within one step further. Do you find that there is carryover psychologically for those sort of physiological buckets of living fit? Yeah. I'm a terrible person to ask that. <laughs> at least you know <laughs> what you know and you know what you don't, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, I, I don't mean to diminish the role that, you know, quite the opposite. I, I will encourage almost all of the athletes I work with to at minimum work with a sports psychologist. That's quite different than psychologists or therapists, but, um, I understand very clearly the role of those things. But having said that, I, I like, I'm just a happy dude. <laughs> like I'm just, um, I, I did, I don't really feel like that is not an area I've had to spend a lot of time focusing on. And I'm, I'm like, probably will get hate mail because I just said that. <laughs> um, but like, how dare you be happy? <laughs> I've just, I've been ambitious my whole life. Like I don't like hard work. I just, I'm, I'm normal to it. Uh, I'm generally, dude, I'm so, I'm just, my life is fucking awesome. Like I'm just so generally happy like all the time. So, um, I totally empathize with everyone who's like, okay, I'm going to strangle you. <laughs> I, I get all that, but I just, I just want to be honest with you. That, like, uh, I'm not a good person to ask this question with. So if you're struggling yeah. in those areas, like, I don't, don't take any of my advice because I generally wake up very focused. I don't have problems staying on task or, or, or that. I mean, of course, like I can just focus on all that once now, but like I'm generally wake up pretty motivated and excited and I don't have to spend a tremendous amount of time I mean, obviously when I do the things that people will generally talk about to improve psychological state, they work and they are effective. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that area is pretty sensitive. So if I flick it a little bit, it moves. It's not very hard for me to recenter myself or to get over a bad day. Yeah. Whatever. Nice. Well, it's been a great. So basically psychology is a bunch of, it's a bunch of hogwash and <laughs> kind of garbage. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, 
So yeah, it's been awesome. On that note, it's been great to have you on the show. No, it has been uh, incredible to have you on the show. I, I really appreciate you diving deep. Uh, we went way longer than normal, um, but oh, I think bad. all I of that. I talk a lot, bro. Hey, that should have been warned. So I, hey, I knew, I knew better. I knew some of your five minute physiology went into 15 minutes. So I get it. <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. Facts. Uh, Facts. Uh, yeah. So no, I really appreciate it. And you know, for, for those that do stick around, I think there is a wealth of knowledge there, especially talking through those three um, videos, you know, and obviously breaking it into the five minutes that, you know, it's where you're, you're just having to glaze over a bunch of stuff. Um, so I highly encourage anybody to go check out all those videos on Andy Galpin's uh, YouTube and check out Body of Knowledge, check out Unplug, check out uh, CSUF if you're in the area. Um, <clears throat> go get in there and learn from this incredible uh, man and professor. Thank you so much. <laughs>